Well, my name is Phil, actually Philip Duran, D-U-R-A-N. Uh, on the first day of school, I actually had a different name when I was born. I was given the name Felipe, uh, and I went my, on my first day of school. Uh, the teachers changed my name to Philip, and that's why until now I've been using the, the name Philip, and I usually spell it with, with two L's. But I'm from uh, Isleta, a little village of Isleta in El Paso County, Texas. That little town is still small like it was before, but it was incorporated into El Paso County uh, several de decades ago. And that's where the tribe uh, Isleta del Sur Pueblo resides. They're also called Tiwa Indians. My mother was from that Pueblo and therefore I inherit that same heritage. However, my mother and father did not identify with the Tiwa Indians. Uh, it was pretty well known in the 1970s that if you're an Indian on the, along the border uh, of uh, El Paso and Juarez and other places as well that uh, you're going to be ostracized. And I don't know that if that was the reason, but that's the reason I think uh, it happened. So that uh, I didn't really know my own heritage until I was 55 years old. My dad uh, passed <coughs> on uh, in the year 1991. <coughs> when uh, his funeral, when I went to his funeral, I had I found out that one of his uh, uh, daughters who had had several children, I think 17 children, two, two of whom did not uh, live, that that large family had done history uh, of our family and they discovered uh, with oral history that my father was actually from the tribe of Isleta del Sur Pueblo. Uh, that was a shock to me because I, but it also answered the question of why was I so dark when I went to school? Because uh, I had a, a Spanish name and I was dark, but the, unit, the government said that I was a white, white person. And that answered the question, that answered two questions. One is, why do I have a Spanish name? Because our family never had relatives in Mexico. So that name must have come directly from the Spaniards. And it also answered the other question, and that is, I finally found out who I really was, that I was uh, American Indian, period. It was in 1998, I was, I was invited to become director of a new school in South Dakota. I was there for one and a half years, and then we ran out of funding and I came back to Western Washington State. <clears throat> and that's when I was hired to be um, in the Department of uh, in the Division of Mathematics and Physics uh, and, uh, well, Science and Mathematics at what Northwest Indian College. When I was at that college, uh, I noticed that Roberto Gonzalez Plaza had gone to a meeting in Albuquerque. It was a seed meeting. And he said, why don't you come with me next time? So eventually, I did that. That was probably around the year 2002. Well, what happened is that I discovered that indigenous worldviews are very close to what I was finding out about quantum mechanics and uh, general relativity, which became an area that I've focused on uh, now since, since the year 2000. And uh, so when I came to SEED, I was already beginning to heal. I was already back into the sciences. I was doing my own work. Uh, I was retired, so to speak. and. Uh, Seed then allows me, uh, gives me the opportunity to express myself uh, in these issues that bridge uh, indigenous worldviews with uh, Western science, and it allows me to meet several people from around the world. I think that uh, my knowledge of physics, which of course is not unique, uh, Many people know physics. Uh, many people have read David Bohm's work. 
I think that my knowledge of physics, but also my knowledge of, of indigenous concepts, uh, gives me a, a particular uh, place in this whole issue of, of uh, how to cor how to make build a correspondence between indigenous concepts, or what's what I call indigenous metaphysics, and uh, and uh, physics as known to the Western world. But uh, but uh, after reading David Bohm and the fact that he does not agree with the orthodox interpretation of, uh, of quantum mechanics, the orthodox interpretation basically, among other things, says that uh, a particle cannot be said, said to exist unless it is observed. Now, Niels Bohr was a positivist. His uh, views were very much influenced by the philosophers in, who held on to positivist views. And that is true of many uh, physics uh, researchers who were really pioneers in the area of quantum, quantum mechanics. Uh, but, but Bohm's work was very useful to me because Bohm believed many way, in many ways what indigen, indigenous peoples have always practiced. And that is, he believed that the universe is united. He believed that the universe is one. He in fact goes as far as to say that possibly the universe is a is a is a, is a big holograph, meaning that uh, of course a holograph is a two-dimensional uh, section that contains three-dimensional information in every part. So, but if you light, if you shed laser light at the right frequency, it will build a three-dimensional image in three-dimensional space. And uh, so Bohm's view, uh, along with believing that the universe is united, he also believed, possibly, that the whole universe is one of these, uh, a large holograph. Well, the interesting thing is, even today, in this current law dialogue, we're asking the same questions. In other words, the Western world is still asking the questions, what is nature? What is the nature of matter? And so forth. But indigenous peoples have always not only known, but experienced the fact that the entire world is imbued by spirit. For example, the Haudenosaunee tell us that the spirit of the grass manifests as real grass. So we see the grass with our eyes, but before the grass appeared in the world, it was the spirit of the grass. And so everything that moves in the world today was originally its own spirit before it was manifested. Well, in quantum physics, in modern physics, we know now, because of Einstein's work, that energy transforms into matter, and back into energy, and back into matter, and so forth. So we know now that matter ar arises from something that is not material, that is, that is uh, energy. But then, what is energy? In my view, the energy is the same spirit that the people have always talked about. And this is that great spirit that pervades the universe, that, pe that indigenous people don't call, they don't call it energy, they call it power. Just like Black Elk, Holy Man Black Elk said one time that uh, the power of the world is in a circle, and he was talking about the whole universe. Because he says, look at the birds, 
They build their nest in a circle. And everything we do is in a circle. And this is one of the things that we're trying to do here among in the dialogues among indigenous peoples is to bring bring the Western world into the circle so that we'll have the concept of the circle. And uh, because a circle is very different from the linear time concepts. The native prophecies are a very important part of, uh, of a life and a reality that the Western world still does not think about. I have written about this question uh, with respect to, respect to the, uh, the hope of this nation, the United States. And I say that the hope of this nation lies in the restoration of uh, native peoples to give them back at least some of the land that was taken so that they can build their own places so that they can exercise their sovereignty. Because as a matter of fact, um, indigenous worldviews do not think of the earth as a commodity. Indigenous worldviews do not think of nature as something to be exploited. And so that's why and that's how Native peoples throughout the, the thousands of years were able to, to sustain their societies doing what they were always doing, following the cycles, respecting the animals and the plants, our, our non-human relatives. And uh, we, say, we say that also because we have been marginalized for so long, we also have discovered some principles of survival that we believe the nation and the nations of the world can use in order to survive themselves. Because now we really, in many ways, we share a common destiny. Now the Hopi people who have their own prophecies uh, and other indigenous nations believe that, of course, we're not living in the same, in the, in the first world. The Western world believes that it's that, uh, that the time is linear uh, and right now we're trying to find out alternative sources of energy and so forth. However, the Hopi people will tell us that the fourth world is probably going to come, uh, that this world is going to end and, and the question is how are we going to prepare for that next world? Because Mother Earth uh, is probably going to bring uh, purification. Not only the Hopi, but the Algonquin peoples as well. They talk about purification. And they have a prophecy called the Seven Fires Prophecy. And, and their prophecies, they prophesied what happened to Native peoples in the 1800s. They said that, that uh, there will be another people coming, a white-skinned people coming from another land will come here. They will come with a face of brotherhood or the face of death. But they said you will not know until later whether or not they came with a face of brotherhood. If they come with a face of brotherhood and a shake and a handshake and new knowledge, it is possible that they are your your, your brother and that, that an eighth fire will be born that will lead us into bliss, eternal bliss. But if they come and they poison the waters, if they come and the waters that you drink now, instead of making you well, they will kill you. If the food that you eat, instead of making you well, it will kill you, then we know they came with the face of death. They came with the face of death because they depopulated about 95% of the population. But on the other hand, on top of that, they also brought their worldviews that exploits the earth, and now the diet, the American diet, is killing many people. It's causing cancer, and so one way or the other, death has been brought to this country, to this nation, and so that's why I try as much as possible to point people to the to the native circle, to indigenous Indian circle, 
so that because that's where we will find healing, that's where we will find health, that's where we will find uh, what we need to restore the world to where it needs to be.